everyone can you all hear me yes so much yeah so yeah we'll wait for 5 minutes so more people can join in and then we'll begin the session हाय उमर व्हेन विल द सेशन बिगन ओम राइट नाउ ओके um so i thought it will be best if we could uh, begin with the definition with the basic definition of pvc so uh, this will the slides will be a general overview of the uh, of the test of pvc and of the article uh, by moham so the definition uh, of pvc is that the right of the individual to be protected against intrusion into his personal life or affairs or those of his family by direct physical means or by publication of information so the publication bit is the one we are more concerned with in 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 uh in the article so as more of the almost all the defendants uh pertain to some kind of a media form either they are a newspaper outlet or they they are uh, an online uh, uh news agency or they are a, a tv channel of some kind so um it's it's very interesting uh, to look at the very recent case of uh, her royal highness uh, the duchess of sussex against the associated newspaper limited so this is the most recent case on pvc um and the judge uh, it's it's although it's not uh, related to the article but i thought it was very interesting because <clears throat> this got a very uh, this got very uh, uh, media attention this a lot of media attention and the judge said megan had a reasonable uh, so the facts of the case were uh, that uh, <clears throat> uh megan markel uh, had sent some letters some private letters to her father and uh, uh, what happened was this this media outlet uh, got hold of those letters and they published those letters in an article and they uh, gave their opinion on that also so uh, she she filed for a claim and the judge said 
that Megan had a reasonable expectation that the contents of the letter would remain private. And uh, the claim was held in favor of the Duchess of Sussex. So what's the test of the, uh, uh, of the uh, to, to establish privacy? The test is derived from Lord Nichols' statement in Campbell against uh, <clears throat> MGN uh, Limited. This is a, uh, this was a newspaper uh, company. Um, the statement was essentially the touchstone of private life is whether, in respect of the disclosed facts, the person in question had a reasonable expectation of privacy. So. So the test, basically, the current test <clears throat> is, uh, if we if we have to determine privacy, uh, it is that it is to ask the question: uh, Did the person in question had a reasonable expectation of privacy? So, two words: reasonable and expectation are extremely important because uh, because they they said these are. Uh, two different kind of conflicting standards. And that is why there's so much criticism on the, on the current test of privacy. So what does the author argue? Uh, in, in her article, she argues that the addition of the word, she, she argues that the word protection should be added to the current privacy test. That is the, 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 the basic argument that she takes. She says, whether the claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy protection. So uh, the new test would be, uh, if the word protection is added, will become whether the claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy protection. Then the test itself would make it clear that the question is whether the claimant was entitled to expect his or her privacy to be protected in the situation in question. Um, so, for example, so what will this this do? The, the what will the addition of the word protection do? What it will do is that there there are certain practices which which are very uh, widespread. For example, CCTV uh, uh, in vigilation. So in, in that case, <clears throat> those practices will not automatically give give the defendant leeway to to, uh, to, to you know uh, say that uh, okay so this is this is the, the 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 claimant did not have a reasonable expectation because because of the because they uh, because the claimant would be uh, protected then even the circumstances where uh, there are certain practices which are widespread will not mean that all rights in respect of it are automatically lost. Uh, I hope I'm not going too fast. So after this, we're going to look at the article itself. Okay. So as you know, the leading case uh, or the uh, from where the test is derived is the case of Campbell. Um, so what the author uh, says is that whether there is a reasonable expectation of privacy by the claimant. So she, she argues that this reasonably, reasonability element is an objective test on the already subjective nature of the test. Hi, I'm not sure why the meeting ended. I think it might be due to the uh, number of participants we have. Maybe that is why. Basically, Zoom meeting has 40 minutes of free time. After 40 minutes, the session automatically ended. 
So I I don't think we had had forty minutes. It was just for not even fifteen minutes. That's sad. Anyways, so. So the author argues that the test is basically a subjective one based on the claimant's expectation, limited by the requirement that his that this expectation be reasonable and that the defendant knew or ought to have known about the about that expectation. What so what does this mean? So this means that. Uh, so we'll analyze what what it really means here. So we have these uh, two articles, ECHR articles. So be because there is there is some kind of a clash. It can be argued that there is a clash when there is a clash between Article Eight and Article Ten is basically when the claim arises. So Article Eight says that everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. and article 10 says everyone has the right to freedom of expression this right shall include freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas can you all hear me yes yes sir okay so so obviously uh, the claim the claimant uh, would argue that their right uh, their article 8 has been breached because they have the right to uh, respect for their private and family life and that has been breached and the defendant would argue then that uh, they were exercising their freedom of expression um and the defendant uh, will almost in all cases will uh, as i've said will will be a, a news outlet of some kind a media outlet <clears throat> um so why is there so much criticism on 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 uh, the current test <clears throat> the first point is that it's not clear so what does the author wants to do she wants to bring certainty to the test she wants to provide an intuitive and conceptual framework to the courts and she wants to make the test more predictable because it right now she argues that it is not as much predictable and it is so because see the test is is such that um it is the uh it it is scattered basically so the test although was established in uh, begin from the case of campbell it has developed in further cases uh such as the case of murray's and and many other cases so on but there is not one single uh, uh space or one single place where you can get the definite answer on how the outcome of of a certain claim would be so there are so many cases and which give uh <laughs> different factors uh on how the courts will assess a previous claim the second um, point is that there is too much onus on claimant although there is that the test is a subjective one but there is a requirement of uh, reasonability because because reasonability at, uh, requirement is 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 one which which is kind of an objective requirement uh, and the claimant already so th this is this is a very important point the claimant already has 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 their defense of article 10 uh, which is the freedom of expression but for the for the uh, the defendant has already the defense of article 10 but for the claimant to establish their claim they have to establish article 8 uh, that their uh, right to privacy was breached and the test uh, which should be because uh, privacy is is uh, is a private matter and it is a subjective matter on on a, on a, on an already subjective matter they have to 
be also reasonable so that is where that is where most of the criticism is because you're putting so much of an onus you're putting so much of a responsibility on on the claimant to prove that their right to privacy has been breached and the third would be the treatment of children because obviously you can't expect reasonability from children so often times uh, in in many of the cases the claimants uh, would be children so uh, one may argue that the reasonability requirement uh, is too harsh on children uh, because they are too young to form an opinion or to expect anything so so what is the uh, view of the author um the author has brought the factors already set by courts for establishing reasonable so this is the these two slides are, the, this slide is the most important one uh, and is the crux of the whole article so her view the author has brought the factors already set by courts for establishing reasonable expectation of privacy and actionable privacy interest under her two suggested broad new principles or rules so what does she say she she has suggested these two principles for courts um through which a privacy claim can be uh, established so what are those two principles the first principle is is a society based principle and the second principle is is more of a claimants based on the claimant signals uh <clears throat> is is more of a subjective one the, so the first question is is claimant's expectation of privacy consistent with the societal attitudes to the information or activity in question and uh, uh she, she what she says is uh, regardless of the regardless of the uh, answer if if the answer is in affirmative or if it is not you you move on to the second question which is what signals did the claimant give that he or she regarded the information or activity in question as private so regarding the first question uh is claimant's expectation of privacy consistent with the societal attitudes to the information or activity in question what does this mean this is a reasonability element or uh, the new defendant new or ought to have known or uh, uh, expect social mores or uh, courts have not so she says that courts have not articulated this principle expressly and this is an objective requirement so an example of this would be that for example there are certain uh, actions which which the society considers as private by the nature of those actions uh what 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 kind of actions are those for example uh, if if there is a sexually intimate activity going on so the whole society considers that it it is it is kind of it is a private act and uh, one should be given privacy uh, in 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 that matter and there are, there are certain and she gives these seven she gives these seven uh, <clears throat> uh here she gives these <clears throat> seven categories rather uh, from the existing case law regarding the first principle <clears throat> what are those seven categories that will be it it will become more clear when you know those seven categories so the first category is the appearance or working of the physical body including matters relating to health bodily functions and nakedness the second is to sexual to sexual inter, uh, encounters or activity the third is the, to the intimate details of one's personal relationship fourth is to the intimacies of one's family and or domestic life the fifth is to the experience of trauma grief or strong emotion sixth is to the inner workings of one's mind including strong emotion and the content of fears fantasies dreams and the seventh is to detailed patterns of one's daily life as would be observed for example as a result of systematic surveillance so these are 
kind of these seven categories she has given are general categories where the society would expect that uh, uh, the privacy should be given uh, to the person in question. The second is the, the claimant base. This is rather uh, one which, <coughs> which is uh, not kind of, uh, which is less widely recognized by the courts. The second principle that she gives is uh, the question that you have to ask is what signals did the claimant give that he or she regarded the information or activity in question as private. And those signals, <clears throat> and th th there are five factors basically uh, within this second principle. <clears throat> uh, the, there's this factor of location, locality. The second is the children and others who lack capacity. The third is the way the material is stored or communicated. The fourth is the surreptitious observation, and the fifth is the defendant's knowledge. Um, so the privacy signals, she argues, that can be physical and behavioral. For example, putting up a hand against photographer storing material in mobile phone. So for example, <clears throat> there are certain uh, privacy signals that the claimant gives, which show that they want privacy in the matter. <clears throat> Uh, and those signals, for example, she uh, at, at one point in the article, she argues that, for example, by the virtue of you being in your room and locking the door or just shutting the door means that you want privacy in, 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 in the space, uh, in that particular space. Uh, and for example, here, like if, if you have even if you are in, in a public space, or even if you, if you are where the media has access to you, if you are putting up your hand against the camera, that means that you do not want them to intrude, or e even though they have access, uh, you do not want them to intrude your privacy, or you do not want to be uh, photographed in the situation. So, uh, in the privacy signals, uh, there's this privacy signals in the misuse of private information case law and the uh, explanatory power of the privacy signals principle. Within the explanatory power of the privacy signals principle, there are these five factors. Uh, location or what was the uh, location of the claimant? So the location matters a lot, for example, if the if the, if the claimant was in a public space, uh, for example, in a park, they can't expect privacy uh, uh, in, in a public space. Um, second is regarding the children and the others who lack capacity though. So she says that uh, regarding children, uh, there are, there's this, so she gives case law examples for every, every factor that she uh, includes. Regarding children, she says that <clears throat> there are certain special uh, consideration that is given to the children because they, uh, because they can't form their opinion. Uh, so <clears throat> you can't expect them to be reasonable. So uh, people have to give, you know, extra weight to uh, children's claims. And uh, for example, uh, in, in, within a public space, even uh, they should be given privacy. Uh, the way material is stored or communicated. So for example, she argues that, um, so if you have your material in your laptop and even if it is not logged, it does not have a uh, password. So um, even in that situation, by the virtue of the information being in your laptop means that it is a private one. And for example, if you give your mobile phone to uh, to your friend or someone to, to see a picture that means that it that means that it is for the purpose of uh, seeing that picture and not to scroll through other things even though they they can even though they have the uh, access to it and even if and she gives another example that even if your phone is not uh, passcode locked even then by the virtue of the information uh, being stored in your phone means that it is a private one. 
then she uh, gives the factor of surreptitious observations. What are those? Those are the observations which are made literally covertly. So for example, by a hidden camera, uh, 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 someone can uh, put a hidden camera up or a bug uh, in your private space. So even though, uh, even though she argues that even though the, the, the material itself gained from the surreptitious observation might not be private. So for example, she argues that even, uh, so there's this uh, covertly uh, taken uh, material uh, from your private space and you were just uh, laying in your bed and you were, or maybe you were just reading a book. Even though the nature of the act, it, even though the society would not consider the act as a private one, but by the virtue of it being uh, covertly uh, taken uh, uh, makes it uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, puts the onus on the defendant. And then the uh, there's this last factor that she talks about, which is the defendant's knowledge. Uh, and she says that uh, it also matters. Uh, it also matters that the defendant's knowledge, if the defendant had a knowledge about a certain thing or not. So for example, <laughs> there are uh, certain things that uh, the defendant might know that uh, the claimant wanted to be private. Uh, so have they taken uh, care of those things or have they given regard to those things? So these are the basic five factors that he talks about. Um, the first one, uh, the privacy signals in the misuse of private information case law. Um, uh, we'll look at uh, from the article. So any questions? No, no questions. Uh, yes, I have one question. Yep. And that is, the, uh, why does the author thinks that the, the, that the test of the reasonable expectation of privacy test is a normative inquiry? Um, we, we are going to look at uh, that also. Here you go. But uh, from, from what I have uh, explained, are there any questions? How much time has passed? Okay. So, so the answer to your question would be <clears throat> here. She 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 uh, she argues from uh, both sides. She says that the reasonable expectation of privacy protection is a normative inquiry. And she says that it is a contextual inquiry. <clears throat> so why does she say that it is a normative inquiry? Concluding that a person has a reasonable expectation of privacy is a sh shorthand for saying that subject to any overriding comp competing interest, the claimant is entitled to expect his or her privacy to be protected in the circumstances of the case. Um, and then she uh, uh, gives the example of different case laws. And she says that a claimant seeking to establish a reasonable expectation of privacy or of privacy protection does not need to establish that he or she had an actual expectation that his or her privacy would be uh, respected in the situation in question. Um, so why would she say that uh, the reasonable expectation of privacy test is a normative inquiry? Is because uh, is because basically the claimant's entitlement to expect his or her privacy to be uh, protected 
in the circumstances of the case so because uh, because she 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 argues that uh, the word protection should be added so here uh, she says that uh, at a, at a certain point in article she says that right now the test is that uh, whether the claimant should be entitled to to expect his or her privacy and by adding the word protection would make the test such as that whether they sh they are in fact entitled to expect their privacy to be protected in the circumstances of the case and then uh, <clears throat> she also uh, considers the argument of uh, of it being a contextual inquiry Yeah. Uh, the particular context of that, she also argues from that side. So she argues from the both sides. Thank you. Do you have any other question? Like a specific question? Because uh, her arguments, uh, so why does she say one thing or why does she uh, uh, suggest these two principles? The basic uh, need for that is that the tests right now are not clear. The tests right now are not as clear as they should be. <clears throat> so that is the basic. And when you read that, you will know. Any other questions? You are saying something about Article 8 and Article 10 contradicting or so. My connection kind of went off and I lost what you were saying during that time. Is it possible that you can repeat a little bit? So Article 8, so someone asked me that uh, if if this is a two part test. So if it is a, a one which article eight is is uh, the court <laughs> analyzes the article eight in respect to the, uh, the claim in respect to the article eight and then uh, in respect to the article 10. The answer to that would be no for me because um, the court first, the claimant argues from the perspective of article eight and what and it is for the claimant to establish Article 8 and Article 10 is just as a defense by the defendant. So if the claimant has established Article 8 that they right to, uh, they, they have a, a right to privacy and that right to privacy has been breached and they uh, satisfy the test of the uh, reasonable expectation of privacy, then, the, then it is for the defendant to, to prove that their right, which, uh, which is the Article 10 right of ECHR, uh, of the right to uh, freedom of expression, their right outweighed the right of the claimant. So their right, uh, so it can be in different uh, situations. So for example, in the public interest. So uh, there are cases where uh, the information disclosed is in the public interest. So in that situation, uh, freedom of expression would outweigh right to privacy. So that is the, where the courts assess. Uh, so it's the, the clash thing is that it's very difficult for them to uh, balance the two because they have to make sure that right to privacy uh, is also given regard to as much as freedom of expression is given regard to. Yes, Ashim.
एनी मोर क्वेश्चन और शुड वी मूव ऑन टू द एग्जामिनेशन क्वेश्चन Yeah, I think you should move on to the examination questions. Thanks. Oh uh, wait. So. Oh. Uh, just a minute. So, uh, slide four was. Uh, Slide four is this one. All right. Um. So um. so we can now move on to i think this this is going to end in i'm not sure if this is but i believe this is going to end in 10 minutes in in 2 minutes so you all can join through the second link uh and then we can uh, touch upon the examination question do do it does any are there no questions One sec. Um, a question here. Could you say? Um, I know you touched on location, but what are the three roles? Did you go through the three roles that location of an activity play in determining whether the person expected a reasonable expectation of privacy, according to the author? I don't know if you had gone through that. Yes, I I have gone through them, but it is uh, the focus is more on uh, doing the examination question. uh and not because i have given i think i have given a reasonable summary of everything do you want it in more detail no those the three that must be distinct must give me what the three roles that location plays what are the three roles that you know location play the three year old the are you right the three year olds who are The three roles R O L E S that location plays in the reasonable expectation of privacy. I'm not sure I understand your question. Could you type it? He said the role in which expectation plays. Hello. The role in which uh, expectation. I think, I think that's that is found that is found at the introduction. where it says courts have made it clear that establishing such an expectation depends on a wide range of factors such as the claimant's location the nature of the activity disclosed and the nature of the activity in which he or she is engaged but there are not only three there are more than three but this is the introduction the the the, the right of the article just give these three but there are more than three So when you when you read the latter part of the article, you find that there are actually more than three. We are going to touch upon that when we uh, uh, when we do the examination questions. So the oh all right. So they are they have removed. I've just received a notification that they have removed the forty minute time limit from my meeting. Okay, good, very nice. Okay, so we can. <clears throat> so the three uh, uh, now i understand what you mean so uh, there was this question also which i sent uh, one of the questions uh, the three roles in which location plays in the reasonable expectation of privacy so we are, we are going to touch upon that also when we do the questions so i think it is very important if you if you read firstly if it is very important that if you read the this part this this is probably the where the most of the understanding of the article comes from <clears throat> this part the sixth part of the article which is the how the two privacy principles work together uh, first to answer your question uh, the location the three <clears throat> 
so these are the three uh, three uh, one two and three these are the three ones you were talking about uh, she says um when determining whether a claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy, first it explains the location. It, it uh, the location explains why what happens in in an inaccessible place will be private, even if it is not particularly intimate or interesting. So, uh, as I uh, as I've given you the example of uh, uh, of a bedroom, uh, it would be an inaccessible place, but uh, there, there might not be something which is which is very interesting going on. But by the virtue of uh, of uh, being that place inaccessible means that uh, 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 means that it it is a private one. Secondly, the privacy means that the location <coughs> criteria also is satisfied. The privacy signal. Second, the privacy signals principle helps show that public and private should not be an all or nothing concepts. Instead. There are degrees of public, the degree being determined in part by the signals the claimant gave about whether he or she wanted to be the subject of the defendant's attention, including through body language, manner of dress, behavior, and the precise nature of his or her public location. So there are certain, and the precise nature of his or her public location means that there are certain uh, locations where, uh, which are not which, which cannot be considered uh, rather strictly public uh, or strictly private. <clears throat> so for example, you may be in an art gallery, maybe something like that. So um, it, it depends what, what signals the claimant gave. So authors <coughs> focus very much is, is on, the, uh, on the signals uh, <coughs> thing that the claimant gives. Thirdly, the signals principle highlights the importance of considering voluntariness in our assessment of location. So these are the uh, three uh, factors, or well, these are the three ones you were talking about. Anyways, uh, this, is, this is really important, these two paras and I should uh, read them. Um, how these uh, two principles, uh, which she argues that uh, should be uh, adopted by the courts, how these two principles should be, uh, will work together. Because one may argue, so the, one of the questions that there may be is that, uh, how do you establish these two principles? Do you need to establish both the principles that the society expects the act or society considers the particular act in question as private and uh, uh, and the, as well as the claimant gave the signals that the particular act uh, that they were doing uh, was a private one to them. And how do you basically go about it? Or do you need to only establish one of these principles? Uh, so the answer to that question is is, is in this part of the article. She says that this article maintains that there exists within the English misuse of private information case law, two independent but interconnected ways of establishing a reasonable expectation of privacy protection. The first way is to show that most reasonable people would regard the information or activity as private. This is the first principle. The second way, which is less widely recognized, is to show that the claimant used socially sanctioned signals to let the defendant know that the access to the information or activity in question was unwelcome. The principal aim of this framework is to provide doctrinal coherence to a currently diffuse multifactorial approach to the reasonable expectation of privacy test, but it is also hoped that the framework can be of some practical use. This final section will therefore show how these two parts of the framework work together to solve practical privacy problems. And this is the most important paragraph. The first thing to ask when applying the framework set out in the article to a particular set of facts is whether reasonable people would agree that the claimant should be protected against the exposure of the information or material in question, that is whether the societal attitudes principle is satisfied 
And if that principle is satisfied, or even if that principle is not satisfied, um, this includes consideration of whether the information or activity falls into one or more of the established categories of usually private information and into how many and how squarely. Once that question has been answered and regardless of the conclusion, the CN makers turn to determine what, if any signals, the claimant gave that he or she regarded the information or activity in question as private. If there were socially recognized signals used, if, for example, the claimant went into his or her house, used a private email account, or held up a hand to the camera, then this will provide an independent ground for establishing a reasonable expectation of privacy protection. So what she says is that privacy signals so our argument is that privacy signals alone, the sec which is the second principle, can alone establish the privacy claim uh, if they are strong ones. Um, but at the same, although she does not say this expressly, but the societal principles alone cannot establish a privacy claim or, or, or cannot satisfy rather the test of privacy because to establish a privacy claim, you also, uh, one, the court also considers the defense by the defendant of Article 10. But uh, regarding the uh, reasonable expectation of privacy, it's the Article 8 and uh, it's the test which, which has to be satisfied first. So thus, even if the societal attitudes principle was established, the claimant's reliance on socially recognized principle signals would strengthen his or her reasonable expectation of privacy protection the converse might also apply the fact that a claimant plainly signaled that he or she did not regard the matter in question as private, for example, by removing his or her clothes in a public place or voluntarily publishing intimate personal information would usually weaken a reasonable expectation of privacy protection, which would otherwise be recognized. So for example, removing clothes is, is an act which is considered by the society as a very private one. But if you do the same act, uh, in, in a public place uh, and you do not signal you, uh, you do not signal that you are considering this the act as a private one so although the society considers the act in question as as, as, a, as a private one um, the courts will are likely to not hold it uh, or, or likely to hold that the reasonable expectation of privacy test has not been satisfied because you yourself went to public place and you yourself did the act which you did, even though it was a private act you did uh, in, in a manner which was public. Right. So, um, any questions? Yeah, we, we are going to discuss the possible questions. Okay, so first we are going to just so can you all see uh, these questions? Yes, we can. Thanks. Okay. So you you people uh, answer this. So the first question is, what justifications re or reasons does the author provide for adding the word protection to the formulation of the reasonable expectation of privacy test? So what do you think are the reasons uh, that the author gives? Or the, or the author provides for adding the word protection. I 
I'm afraid you would have to speak because I cannot see the chat while I'm sharing the screen. The person said to avoid the misunderstanding that English law uses the Californian approach. No, the answer to this question would not be that. She says um, here, uh, Here. She says a simple change to the formulation of the reasonable expectation of privacy test would make this clearer. If courts were to add the word protection to the end of the test, so would add the question became whether the claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy protection. And then this is the reason that she gives. Then the epithet itself, the test itself, or the statement itself would make it clear that the question is whether the claimant was entitled. So it is the entitlement part, I think which uh, which is which which is the reason that she says that uh, uh, the word protection should be added to to expect his or her privacy to be protected in the situation in question and she gives the uh, uh, supreme court case example uh, she she backs this up from the case of judicial review 38 which is here this one so uh, she cites that case as, uh, as an authority. Uh, yes, but she criticizes the Californian approach above first, and then only she suggested to add this word protection uh, into the reasonable expectation of privacy. So she criticizes the Californian approach first, only then she made a suggestion. Yeah. She criticizes the uh, because um, she she's given the Californian example. Uh, she gives examples from other jurisdictions also. One is the Californian one. Another is I think uh, one from New Zealand. I think. Um, and what why she she gives the, these examples from other jurisdictions is because her argument is that more or less the reasonable expectation of privacy test is is, is applied the same rather uh, in, 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 uh, in those jurisdictions as well. So uh, uh, in that view, she, she then argues that the word protection should be added so that the claimant has an entitlement to expect her reason or privacy. That is the reason, the reason that. If or, it's the same, uh, then why is a suggestion needed? Uh, if it's the same, then why is the suggestion needed? Yes, actually, um, if you read above, she actually made a point first. Only no. then she made a suggestion so that because okay. if you look at, let me see my. The Shulman. She, no, no, she mentioned key notch against HM advocate. Where not hope uh, made a hint that English, the English law uses the um, Californian approach, which is, uh, in her opinion, untrue. So to avoid this, uh, this misunderstanding, she then suggests uh, using the word protection to avoid that misunderstanding. The context, of, uh, where are you reading from? Where are you referring to, rather? The one you highlighted, Kim Notch, uh, again, HM and advocate, Lot Hope observe in orbiter. Um, she cites the case of uh, Weller and Murray, and then she says that it follows that reasonable expectation of privacy test is not a factual uh, question. But sorry, sorry uh, below that, below that, below that. Well, this is the first paragraph of the third page. Yes, thank you. This one? Um, yeah, Kim, I don't know how to spell it, Kim Lodge. Kim Lodge against HM Advocate, Lord Hope. Okay, so this one. 
for example in kinloch against uh, uh, lord hope of craighead observed in orbiter dicta that a person has to expect to be the subject of monitoring on closed circuit television in public areas where he may go as it is a familiar feature in places that the public that the uh, public frequent yeah it is the uh, it is the argument yeah because i i have addressed this also in uh, wait let me show um yeah so so um by adding the word protection yeah so activities which which are considered uh widespread which are widespread will not automatically mean that uh the right in respect of it the right to respect has automatically been lost yes so, you are right you are right so uh, to avoid this misunderstanding because she cited kim lodge to say that the English law, Lord Hope actually hinted that English law observed the Californian approach in this sense. The word familiar feature is a hint. So to avoid that misunderstanding, she's suggesting to add the word protection to make the task clearer that the English approach is the way it is. It is not the Californian approach. And that is the point of uh, adding the word protection. Yeah, but at the same time, yeah, this is true. But at, at the same time, she says that uh, the uh, the test for the reasonability is is uh, also similar uh, in in many jurisdictions. And uh, this argument, uh, and she, <clears throat> when she uh, somewhere in the article. She she does say that this article uh, is uh, considers that the expectation of reasonability because certain uh, certain uh, authors argue that the this 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 test should completely be abolished. So she 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 says that uh, this article the one particular. Uh, we have been given is, is is starts from the assumption that the uh, the requirement of reasonability, reasonable expectation of privacy, is a good one. She, she, so she starts uh, with that, and then she gives these two principles. And yes, you are correct in that. Um, should we move on to the second question? Yes, thank you. Uh, explain what are explain what are the two interrelated ways of showing that an information or an activity is private for the purposes of the misuse of private information action. So, in in more or less in in uh, in in many of the answers, the basic argument would uh, come back to those two principles. Uh, the first is the societal principle. Principle and the second is the privacy signals that the claimant gave. So even in even the answer to this one would be that. Does anybody else have a different opinion? Um, I do not have any. I'm sorry. I'm just gonna bring this question to you. I don't have any issue with the article. Like I'm good at understanding the content of it, but. Honestly, I do not know since I'm since I'm self studying. I just want to know how to tackle the question. I mean, for instance, if you want to answer part B, um, how much do you have to write really, and how do you cite cases? Do you just put up the principle of a case and then in brackets mention the case, or do you like in in an essay form answer the question? Um, because uh, this is this is more of a comprehension or. Uh, part of the examination. Um, the examiner would not want that you you use give your own opinions and uh, so what you have to do is uh, you have to extract the information from the article and then you have to uh, as much as it is possible without changing the meaning, you have to uh, put it as your answer. 
So how to, did you ask how to go about it? Like how to cite cases? No, citation, I'm fine with that. Um, like you told me, like you just cleared the question for me. You told me that you have to, uh, without changing and adding your own opinion, that's totally fine. I, I'm going to do that. Uh, but basically just length and um, I do not know, like for the four parts, obviously the answers are going to be short and are only going to be from the article, but just the pattern for it, honestly. But I think that there's no specific pattern. I think you just have to write what you have, what you know. You read the examiner reports. In one of the examiner report, uh, the examiner says that uh, it is not uh, specifically that every part of the uh, question, uh, every answer to every part of the question would be the same in length. So what students, uh, the examiner says, uh, do, do they, what the mistake is that they try to answer every question uh, in the same length. So there, there will be certain parts which, 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 are, which have a very simple answer. And that is absolutely fine because they do not constitute the same marks. Because on the whole, only the part A on the whole uh, has 25 marks. Not, uh, it is not divided into equally into parts. So one part may have more marks than the other one. And then you will uh, get to know this when you answer the question because there will be certain questions which are more complex than the other ones. And then you will get to know which, which question you have to. And if the, the, the uh, your, your opinion might be asked for uh, ID examiner, if, if your opinion is asked, if your take is asked, what is your take on the article or on the proposed two principles, then you can answer it in your own way. Thank you. Thank you so much. And the question that you've brought up, um, part A, do you, have you got this from the VLE? Do we have the examiner report for this? Uh, no, unfortunately. I'll be sharing uh, more questions. Uh, this is from my institution. This is not from the VLE. The VLE one is, uh, is this one. Uh, this is from the module guide. These are five questions. Okay, thank you very much. Any other question? Uh, yes, Umar, I have a question. Uh, what, how would the answer change if we change the word explain to discuss? So um, explain, uh, basically means explain simply means that explain what is already there discuss would mean you have to give you have to weigh both point of views so you have to give uh, you have to uh, contrast basically to you have to uh, give one point of view and then you have to uh, compare it with another and then you have to give your analysis so you have to discuss uh, both the sides that is what discussion means to people discussing or two or more people discussing. So explain explain simply means that you have to explain what is already there. Thank you. More does anybody have any questions? Okay, anyways. So we are uh, on part B of the uh, of this exam. Um, and the examiner asks for two interrelated ways of showing that an information or an activity is private for the purposes of the misuse of private information action. So what are those two interrelated ways of showing that an information is private? Anyone? Could you repeat back your question, Omar? The question is there. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, sorry. I think question B is exactly on how the two privacy principles work together because they are interrelated. And that is just another way of asking it. Yeah. So the answer to this question would be, uh, 
here. The article says that there are two interrelated ways of showing that information or an activity is private for the purposes of the misuse of private information action. One is the claimant focused route, which examines the signals the claimant used to communicate that he or she regarded the information or activity as private. The second is the society focused route to satisfying the test. This part of the, uh, the societal attitudes to the activity or information in question on whether reasonable people would regard the matter as private vis-a-vis -vis those to whom it was exposed. So these are the two interrelated ways. The two interrelated ways are basically uh, most of the answers derived from this first principle, the societal attitudes to the information in question uh, and its linkage with the claimant's privacy settings. So that is Excuse me, could you show that page again so, so I could find it, please, on my Thanks. The article page? The page of the article that you just showed. Thanks. This question is actually very broad. So in your opinion, what do you think that the examiners would expect us to write? Um, what would the examiner expect us to write um, in, in part A, generally or? No, 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 the question, the specific question just now, question B. The, the examiner would obviously uh, want you to identify uh, what the question is about and identify the relevant portion of the article. This is, this is a very easy part. This is a very easy part of the examination part A. You just have to, uh, just have to identify, just have to comprehend the article. You just have to identify the relevant portion from the article and then answer it. So you just have to. Sorry, sorry. I mean, uh, question B, the question, I mean, what are the two interrelated ways of showing that question, not part A in general, that specific question? Because the question asks the two interrelated ways, which are basically societal attitude principle and the socially endorsed privacy signal principle. And it is the key of the entire article. So it is very broad. And I don't think we should or could write um, the, the entire keys of article into that sp specific question. So what do you think that the examiner would expect? The essence of it, thanks. The essence of it would be uh, would be first, what are those two interrelated ways of uh, showing? The two interrelated uh, ways are the principles, and then uh, the examiner asks, explain what are those two interrelated. So what you can do is, I'm just giving an outline. What what you can do is, you can you can expand on those two principles. The first principle, the societal principle, um, is is a simple one. And then you can explain that this is this is the one. Th these are two principles. These are two interrelated principles. And then you can go on uh, and say that the first principle uh, uh, entails this, this, this. So, for example, the first principle inculcates that uh, how the society, uh, in particular, regards the uh, act as. So, you can, you explanation means you can explain it in your own way, or you can you can explain it. Uh, so one explanation can be different from another. So you can explain the societal attitudes principle in your in your own way because the uh, the author of the article gives various examples to explain the principle, and you can use any example. And that and the same goes for the uh, privacy signals. So, but the uh, but what what is the specific uh, uh, requirement is that. The first principle is is uh, 
any example the second principle there are these five particular categories education uh, children regarding children regarding defendant's knowledge regarding uh, 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 these th there are these five uh, uh, categories uh, that the author uh, defines so you can cite those categories and then you can uh, explain it uh, generally given an overview of those categories Uh, how would you get a first class showing broad reading if you are only summarizing one article? Are you expected to do more? No, Yuan. See, the first class is more about, it's not that you're going to do part A really well and you're going to score 20. Even if you get 25 marks uh, in part A, would not necessarily guarantee that you're going to get a first class because it a lot depends on the three other questions that you answer. So uh, the ex it's about the examiner's expectation. So the examiner's expectations are different uh, on, on part A and on part B. So on part A, the examiner knows that the material is because in, in, in a typical exam setting, the article would not be with you. Okay. So when the article is not with you, then it becomes a, a little more difficult for you to answer the question, even the simple ones. But when, when, when you have the article with you, it becomes a lot easier. And the expectation remains the same for whatever the examination setting is. Uh, the, you have to identify, you have to comprehend, but uh, the first class is a lot depends on the other three questions that you answer. You may get 20, plus marks in, in part A, but you, you may not get uh, first class. Or Thanks, you, you have back the reasonable expectations of the grader in part A. <laughs> okay, should we move on to the C part? Uh, what three roles does, we have already answered this. The three roles that the location of an activity play in determining whether a claimant has a reasonable expectation of privacy as per the author. And uh, those uh, three roles that the location plays. Uh, so the examiner asks, just asks what are what three roles. So you just have to cite those three roles. Uh, so these are the three roles that the location plays. It explains why what happens uh, in an accessible place will be private. And these three, we have already talked about it. Um, the last part of this is what are the two situations explained by the author wherein knowledge of claimant's reasonable expectation of privacy protection by the defendant be assumed. So the assumption of the uh, defend, uh, defendant's knowledge, what, what are the two situations in which, in which the course will assume that? This, this question um, is, is similar to the B part. It basically um, pertains to the two principles. And uh, so here's the answer to that question. Uh, it's about the reasonable expectation and the uh, signals. And the reasonable expectation is from the society. Um, so uh, here's the answer. So there are uh, the framework set out in the article makes it clear first that there are two situations in which knowledge of the claimant's reasonable expectation of privacy protection should be assumed. The first situation is where the activity or information in question is something which reasonable people would regard as private. Secondly, in return to privacy signals, a defendant will be assumed to know that there are certain physical and behavioral signals which society expects will be respected. So more or less, 
everything that she talks about she uh takes it back to the two principles that she she has suggested for the courts to consider any questions um should we uh should we end the session or do you want to do the five questions in the module guide you have to contribute i mean like i'm not excuse me have you done question c and d already mm. of the ones that you sent out not the module guide, the one that you had on screen before. I know you did A and B. Did you do questions C and D? Yes, I just did. Uh, okay, so you could move to the module guide once, please. Thanks, I appreciate it. Okay, you have to answer the module guide once, then I'll then I'll see what can be added to to, to your answers. um this is this is a good read too someone uh, suggested me this this is an article which uh, the author refers to in her uh, references this is an article by eric brandt problems with the reasonable expectation of privacy test and this very really simply outlines uh, what is there and what needs to be changed this is a good read too because the examiner uh, one other thing the examiner uh, in in uh, i read in an examiner report i think it was in the examiner report or maybe it was in by the by, said by simon askey um the footnotes also have to be you, you also have to know the important bits from the footnotes so there there are certain important things in the footnotes so for example there is this uh, the, the, and some very interesting uh, references for example there was this article where uh, a claim was brought uh, about and uh, the mirror or, or not the mirror but the glass wall that they had uh, was a see through one and people were making videos and there was this office where uh, two employees were uh, very intimate and uh, people were making videos and the court said that they could not have a reasonable expectation because uh, <clears throat> because uh, the mirror one was the the glass was the one, was a see through one and they had the lights turned on in the office so uh, the onus was on them it was it, it was a really interesting article so um, <clears throat> you you also have there are certain examples uh, <clears throat> or maybe there are certain academic references uh, in the footnotes which which you should also read okay uh, so you also have to be familiar with footnotes because the examiner might ask you something which which is not uh, directly from the article but uh, it is within the footnotes so these are the footnotes really short so you can anyways uh, the questions are uh, from the module guide um In her introduction to the article, what use does the author make of approaches in other jurisdictions to the question of what constitutes a reasonable? So this is the question uh, which the someone was referring to when uh, the answer to this question someone was referring to in their discussion, I think, before the Californian case. Uh, 
So what is the answer to this question? So this is given by the author of the module guide himself or herself. So these are really important questions. And these are kind of the questions that you might be asked in the examination. The, the, this is the best uh, possible closest way that you can get. So what, what would be the answer to part A? To make the law certain and to emphasize on the subjectivity of privacy. So what 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 is that uh, uh, source that she relies from other jurisdiction? What was the case that she relied upon? It was a Californian Supreme Court case. Um, it's the case of Shulman. in the introductory part of her article. Yeah. Um, a reasonable expectation of privacy test is not a factual question about what potential privacy infringers can or usually do in this situation in question. Courts in other jurisdictions have, however, interpreted it in this way, for example, in Shulman against W Productions Limited, the California Supreme Court held that the claimant could not have had a reasonable expectation that members of the media would be excluded or prevented from photographing her as she was attended by a paramedics at the scene of a serious road accident because for journalists to attend and record the scenes of accidents and rescues in no way was usual, unusual or unexpected. And then she gives her uh, in contrast, the claimant did not have an objectively reasonable expectation of privacy in respect of conversations conducted inside a rescue helicopter because the court was aware of no, no law or custom permitting the press to ride in ambulances or enter hospital rooms during treatment without the patient's consent. And she relies upon the case of Shulman. Uh, in other words, whether claimant had an objectively reasonable expectation of privacy depended not on whether the defendant's conduct was acceptable, but on whether the media usually respected an individual's privacy in the situations in question. And so this type of reasoning can also be found seen in English privacy decision. So this is some this is the thing that I was talking about. So what she says is not she uh, what she says is that. There, there are uh, decisions in in other jurisdictions from other jurisdiction uh, which 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 are uh, also uh, hinted at or, or how they they have come to a decision uh, in in the English cases as well. So she contrasts the case of Shulman with with Kinlach against. Uh, a, her Majesty's advocate agent. And Lord Hope of Craighead observed in obiter dicta that so this is an English case. Uh, expect to be the subject of monitoring on closed circuit television in public areas where he may go, as it is a familiar feature in places that the public frequent. So th the same argument they were taking uh, here. Media usually respected, whether the media is usually respected and uh, un, uh, and rescued in no way unusual or unexpected. So the same argument is taken by the English courts. So this is what I was talking about. Although this statement is in fact probably an oblique reference to social mores in respect of CCTV recalling, taken at face value, it could be taken to mean that one cannot have a reasonable expectation of privacy in respect of it simply because it is so common. So she argues this, which I've already mentioned in the slides. So because sim simply because a practice is, 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 is one which is so common does not mean that the person is not entitled to expect privacy protection. 
I hope that answers. Any questions? No questions? Yes, questions. Stop questions. Actually, the answer is um, on the first page, second, para, second paragraph of the first page. By uncovering these principles, see, um, I, I, I have uh, referred to the whole article and uh, I've referred to even the, uh, lately I referred to the answer. They, there are answers within the, by the way, within the module guide as well. And they also answer it in this way. Uh, you, you may uh, find uh, some other way to answer it, but uncovering these principles for the first time, this article seeks to recalibrate our understanding of the legal privacy interests, the first aim in doing, uh, in, 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 in doing this to bring more certainty to the application of the. She asked in her introduction to the article, what use does the author make of the approaches in other jurisdiction? So what other jurisdiction is there in the second part? I would rather argue this. Because Weller and Associated Newspaper is, is the case of in England and Wales Court of Appeal which is their own jurisdiction. So the first case in, from another jurisdiction in the article comes only at this point here. This is the first case that she refers to from any other jurisdiction and which, which can be constituted from the, do you get my point? Sorry, sorry, my bad. <laughs> Um, in your own words and giving examples, what does the author mean by contextual inquiry? So this is a very simple question. Um, can anybody answer? The starting point is the array factors. Uh, which vectors? Murray, M U R R A Y, the case of Murray. Yeah, the Murray factors. Um, yeah, the location and the uh, activity in question, the, those factors. Yeah, that's correct. That's from the Murray case. <clears throat> Not all of them are from the Murray case. She, she relies on. Uh, She relies on the, this is also a very important point in, in the article, N the nature and purpose of the intrusion. Uh, uh, because the judge in, in, in the case of Murray said that the, the nature and purpose of the intrusion. So this is, this is highly criticized. This is extremely criticized because what could be the purpose of, why do you need to, this, this puts very much, uh, burden on the, on the claimant, if you are gonna uh, give this uh, leeway to the defendant that you are gonna see the nature and purpose of the intrusion of the defendant, uh, whatever the purpose uh, person is entitled to uh, expect their privacy. And this is extremely criticized at different points in the article. Uh, that will be a long discussion. Uh, so, yeah, that is correct. Uh, what underpins the societal attitudes principle? Um, pardon, why did she criticize the uh, nature and purpose of the intrusion discussion? Uh, what about the nature and purpose of the... What did you say? Uh, where, where did Marham criticize that factor, that particular factor? Yeah, Moham herself criticized 
uh, the contextual one? No, um, if I'm not mistaken, you say that Morham criticized the factor of nature and purpose of the intrusion. Yes, that's correct. Um, yes, and um, where is it? Because I might miss that point. Okay. Many of the factors which the Court of Appeal in Murray identified as bearing on claimant's reasonable expectation of privacy, including the nature and purpose of the intrusion, the attributes of the claimant and the circumstances in which the purpose for which the information came into the hands of the publisher, direct courts towards this detailed contextual inquiry into the exact nature of the uh, claimant's object, uh, objection. Um, I, I, I can't, cannot, like I can send you after this session, I can send you the exact. They include the attributes of the, uh, as we say. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Exact, thank you very much. I can send you the exact point where she says that. But she, um, even, if, even if she herself does not uh, say it, she refers, to, uh, she refers to this article, if you may say this one. Uh, this one and uh, where she refers that uh, 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 where she refers uh, that other uh, uh, authors uh, uh, criticize it uh, and here is that uh, one. Uh, in Murray, the Court of Appeal said that one of the factors to be taken into account in determining whether the claimant had a reasonable expectation of privacy was the nature and purpose of the intrusion. That allows courts to consider the reasons why the media decided to intrude on personal privacy and the sort of story it had in mind when it did so. This means there, in fact, in effect, a double continuing of this uh, meaning, in this argument, the media or other defending can cause it can use it to weaken the claimant's case of privacy and then again at the second stage when considering the strength of its claims to be exercising its freedom of expression so what what is the author saying here that Murray refers to Murray herself refers to this article by the way um, the uh, the author here is saying that you uh, the, the defendant already has uh, article 10 uh, defense to them they already uh, can defend themselves uh, by by saying that they were exercising their freedom of speech, but by but when you are considering the claim at the first step, when you are considering the claim of the claimant, uh, uh, when, and when in that when you uh, consider the nature and purpose of the intrusion of the defendant, it it becomes a very heavy burden on the claimant to prove his or her claim. It's a, it's a very fine point. Can you, do you understand? It? I see where you're coming from, but um, maybe this could add as a, as an evaluation on the test itself rather than Morsham um, argument. Is it true? Um, I do not. I feel extremely bad, but I did not uh, get your question. Could you repeat that? Yes, yes, sorry. I mean, this is a point made by this author and not Marham. So maybe this can be an evaluation to our answer yes. rather than as a comprehension of the Morsham's article itself. Yeah, Morham's article basically. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so Morham's article basically, what I had in the slides is basically her problem is, her major problem is yes, this can be a part of the evaluation, uh, rather. But uh, Morham's basic point is that the test is not clear, it it is not predictable, it is not, uh, it is very scattered one, in many cases and uh, uh, 
her uh, uh, second point was that uh, uh, her second point was that it it puts very much onus on the claimant. So yeah, regarding that, um, yeah, so th this is the basic point and nature and purpose of the intrusion. So she she um, talks about these things in bits and pieces throughout the article, but that is not the important bit. The important bit is that she wants to make the test clear for the courts. And in making the test clear for the courts, she, she suggests her own two principles. One is the societal principle, and the second is the, uh, the privacy signals given by the claimant. So one is the objective one, the societal one is an objective one, and the uh, uh, the one uh, that is, uh, which is the uh, claimant signals are, is a subjective one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have uh, two more questions, three more questions, two more questions. Um, so have we done what underpins the societal attitudes principle? No, we haven't. So can anybody answer this one? Can anybody answer this one? Because I have an iftar in a few minutes. This as um, what is the social normative perception? I mean, what underpins this principle is what reasonable, uh, reasonable man thinks in general, and. Um, <clears throat> so the answer to this question is, uh, and there are several pointers to this, to answering this question, to what is the social normative perception. The first pointer is what is the contemporary moral standards. And second one is the contemporary societal values, which is the approach taken in New Zealand in the case of husking and ranting. And Morhan also mentioned um, the structure of the European Court of Human Rights case of Zach and Finland. So there are several pointers to answering what is uh, underpinning the societal attitude principles, which is to answer what do reasonable men think whether they think the matter at stake is private? Yes, that's true. But you do not need to go into a lot of detail. I, I, I assume that you, you're going to, you do not have to go into so much of detail while answering such a simple question. I understand that there's so many, but this, the, the answer to this question uh, could be very simple one. Um, and uh, the answer to this question can be is, is can be found here. Um, uh, it 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 is that the question is that uh, what constitutes the claimant's privacy signals? Uh, what was the question? Uh, what what underpins this societal attitudes principle? Although not highly developed yet by courts. This involves the court simply asking whether the reasonable person would regard the matter as private in relation to the rece recipient of the information. So <clears throat> uh, that is the answer to the question, a, a very simple answer. Um, so it is just one sentence, a one-liner? Yeah, the answer can be, it's perfectly all right for the answer to be a one-liner. Not a one-liner, but uh, it's perfectly fine if the answer is uh, in three lines, within three lines, within four. You do not need to stretch it because there will be questions. There will definitely be questions which require one or two paragraphs. Or you, uh, yeah. So um, there will be parts of the part A question which which require two two paragraphs even. So uh, 
it's perfectly all right for one answer to be three liner uh, and the other to be two paragraphs three par two paragraphs so uh, so you do not have to stretch every answer you'll get to know what answers require what answer requires more details than the other one what constitutes the claimant's privacy signals give a case law example of its use you can give many case law examples in this one uh, what constitutes the claimant's privacy signals anybody your line is what um here maybe just mention um a point like if you want to mention location then go ahead and mention location if you want to discuss defendant's knowledge then go ahead and discuss defendant's knowledge i think you do not need to answer that this question in, in uh, the answer would be uh, could simply be you you can give uh, many case law examples um but the basic principle under this principle a claimant can establish a reasonable expectation of privacy protection by showing that he or she made it clear to the defendant that disclosure or observation of the information or activity in question was unwelcome and that society would usually expect such a signal to be respected so this is where your answer is and you can uh, give many case law examples such as uh, even the muslim one but uh, the strong one would be the weller one uh, the case of weller uh, uh, which has been cited many times in the article and a very important one so the case of uh, in addition to the campbell case the case of weller and the case of murray are two very important cases that she she gives ref she refers to uh, at different points in the article uh, uh, and the last question is how can the authors two principles work together to be applied in law given example this is a very interesting question and this this is from the put the pause huh this is from the uh, from the paras we have read already uh and we have analyzed already so uh, uh this is under the sixth part of the article uh how the two privacy principles work together and uh, here the author mentions how the, the two principles the societal principle and the signals principle uh can work together so even if one principle is not established uh it, it is perfectly all right that the claim can be established so for example even if the society uh so she gives a case law example for example in one of the cases uh, uh which was brought to the court was that uh there was a singer uh because singers uh, singers uh, are public figures and uh, usually uh uh they they attract publicity but uh, very unusually for that singer she did not want publicity and it was clear for from, from her acts previously that she she guarded her private life uh, very carefully and uh, so morham gives that case the example and she says that so in that case the societal principle would be uh, would be uh, would say that the society would expect for for a singer to to be less private but uh, in that case uh, her signals made it uh, made her claim more uh, strong 
so it can be perfectly it is perfectly fine for a claim to be uh, to not have a authority or to not have such a societal uh, uh, the society might not expect that to be uh, act to be private but the claimant in question might use his or her signals to show that he or she considers the act in question as very private and the examples to these things are given here so yeah so i think <clears throat> that's about it if there are no further questions then i can end the session if there are any general questions or any questions specific to the article you can ask uh, i have a question kindly if possible share uh, the recording will be shared or not yeah if you would want because that's why uh, i i i selected this option i think it is recording and if it if i have the file then uh, i can if you would want i can share it with you because it yes i want and the second favor i want if possible kindly share the article presentation as well yeah i can share it with you i don't know how to share it with everyone because that would take a lot of time and that would require everyone's emails but uh, does everybody want the slides or like i can send it to you you can send me a message back yes i will uh, send you a message yes yes please <clears throat> maybe you can share us via yes. whatsapp as well or uh, if i'll be able to share these slides on whatsapp because even if i share these slides on whatsapp you won't be able to you you can take the pictures i can share because I, i'm not sure if you would be able to open it because this is from this is from macbook and it doesn't support anything you would have to it won't i i'm pretty sure it won't open i can i can share the screen and then you can take picture that's better this is the most important bit of the of the whole uh, of this whole session this is the crux of everything if you understand this one this bit you understand the whole article and you can answer any question so uh, this is the first one this is the second one uh the definition of privacy uh the reason this is not needed <clears throat> the duchess of sussex case but it's it's interesting to look at it's very interesting case because the judge in this case uh, gave the judgment uh the preliminary judgment it's called uh and uh, written judgment and uh, uh, they did not uh, like hold the hearing as such so it, it's really interesting case uh and the uh, defendant's argument in this case was also very interesting so this is the test the test is only this one that the person in question had a reasonable expectation of privacy this is in the case of campbell uh and the, she argues the to add the word protection to be added and uh, then we have the leading case of campbell and then we have the this debate over article 8 and article 10 and then why is it so criticized uh uh it's not clear there is so much on the claimant then mohan's view which is really important and then the two principles this is the Your opinion on the article, uh, buddy. Could you repeat on the slides again from the top? Morning. Uh, I think this this is what you need to get. This is the most important because it took a lot of time. This is this is the important bit. This is an objective one, the societal one. the second one the signals one is a subjective one
Do you mind sharing your opinion on the article? What do you think of the article? Uh, in what aspect? Any aspect. Any aspect. Well, uh, my general opinion would be that the article makes it uh, more uh, the 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 reasonability the reasonable test uh, the test of the established the, the test to establish privacy, which is the re reasonable expectation test, more um, complicated. A more complex because although it outlines um, clearly the things which the courts need to consider in one single uh, place, at the same time it it, it is an article which um, although it it makes it very clear to the to the reader, but uh, at the same time it makes it makes the concept of protection of privacy complex. Morning, morning. So um, maybe uh, like the other uh, authors have said that you abolish this test completely and you, if there is a breach, you put the onus on, uh, on the, you put the onus on the defendant to defend themselves when there is a breach of privacy. So maybe that, that approach can be is is a, is an easier one because Do you mean that you would, um, sorry sorry you can continue sorry no so that that's Do you mean that you prefer eric's opinion that he prefers um instead of emphasizing on the first stage of reasonable expectation of privacy he prefers emphasizing on the second stage of the balancing exercise Meaning that he takes a very broad view as to establishing a reasonable expectation of privacy, but then limits its um, extent when deciding um, the freedom of expression. Which this is exactly contrary to Morham's um, opinion because she prefers emphasizing on the reasonable expectation of privacy test instead of the balancing exercise. I would, um, yes, maybe I would, uh, I would prefer Eric's point of view because, but at the same time, I, if the courts can inculcate this, uh, these two principles in, in all its simplicity, then maybe yes, this is, this is a good direction for the courts, but at the same time for the claimants, it's a very lengthy one. So because the, the test right now is that the claimants need to satisfy that they had a reasonable expectation. So maybe the courts can, as as argues that maybe that the courts can either they can like they can abolish the test completely or they can like the they can. Uh, abolish the requirement of uh, reasonability means because the because the defendant uh, is anyway gonna argue article 10 that they had the freedom of expression and uh, and uh, it uh, and the defendant and the uh, claimant is gonna argue that the defendant knew or ought to have known so maybe yes eric's point of view will if you say that you prefer completely abolishing the test completely, which is actually different from Eric's point of view, because he says. Yes, but Eric suggests, yes I, I, I do know that. But Eric suggests, but Eric does mention uh, the authors which, uh, which, which, su which suggest that, who suggest that uh, the test should be abolished completely. She does refer to those authors, right? Um, do you mean Eric or Moham? No, not Eric, but Eric in our article. She does mention uh, uh, those uh, point of views which exist. So uh, I'm saying that either Eric's point of view or the point of view of those authors who suggest that the test should be com uh, polished completely. 
Could you show us uh, slide one and slide two once again, please? And the questions, please. Uh, the questions I've sent already. Uh, the questions I've sent already uh, and the slides, yes, I can show you. Now, this is the slide one. And uh, this is uh, slide two. Uh, slide one would be? Okay, all right. Okay, uh, where did you send the question once again? Uh, where did I? Where, where, where did you send the question? The questions. Um, yes, question I please. Questions on WhatsApp. Did you not receive those? Uh, no, I did not. All right. Um, I'll. Okay, I'll I'll share the screen with you. Uh, does anybody else have any questions? Th these are the questions from the module guide, which you will have already. Uh, it's on page right. What page? It's on page two one two of the module guide, and these are the questions which I sent. And I am gonna send you if you uh, if you want more questions, then uh, send me a message uh, on on WhatsApp maybe, or email me, and then I can send you more questions. Here's my email. Sure. Thank you. And should I need a recording of the session? Does anybody need a recording? Yes, I need buddy. Uh, okay, I'll upload it to YouTube. Here. YouTube.com slash. I'll upload it here, okay? Any more questions? Harry, Harry has a question in the chat. No, it's it rather. I would argue that it rather the word protection rather. Uh, rather makes it easier for claimant to, to prove that they had a reasonable expectation of privacy. Because reasonable expectation of privacy is difficult, uh, is, is more of, uh, is, is less clear than uh, reasonable expectation of privacy protection. So if you go through our argument, then you will get to know what I mean by this. So uh, it's not that uh, the privacy word privacy uh, is added to, to limit the claimant's expectation. No, it's 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 rather the contrary. It rather uh, makes it easier for the claimant. I would agree with the speaker. Uh, anything else? It's good. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thank you very much. <laughs>